Hello and welcome to Truth For Today with Pastor Richard Whitcomb. My name is Pastor Gabriel Jima and it's my pleasure to present these webcasts. In today's episode of Truth For Today, Pastor Whitcomb begins a new sermon series entitled How To Be Good At Being Rich with a sermon entitled You Are Richer Than You Think. I believe the sermons in this series are relevant to the season we are all in. As you watch this program, I trust that the Spirit of God will minister hope and faith to your heart as you receive the word ministry of Pastor Whitcomb. Waylon Pendergrast was a 37-year-old man living in Tampa, Florida, USA. Well, one night he went out and got drunk. In fact, he got very, very drunk. On his way home, he was staggering down the street when he passed a house with an open window. Being drunk and not thinking clearly enough, Waylon decided to enter the house through the window and see if there was anything valuable he could steal. So he entered the house through the open window and he saw many valuable things. He found some cash and other valuables, and Wayland decided to fill a suitcase and make off with the goods. But then, before he left the house, he decided to set the house on fire so that he could cover his tracks. He figured if the house burned down, no one would know that he had stolen things from the home. So Wayland grabbed his loot, set the house on fire, and then escaped through the back door and made his way home, laughing to himself at how clever he was. Waylon staggered up and down the streets for another 10 minutes or so until he finally came to the street where he lived. But to his surprise, as he came close to his home, he discovered a fire engine outside his house. He looked up and saw that his very own house was on fire and the fire service was working hard to put out the blaze. After the fire was put out, the excitement had died down and the alcohol began to wear off, Waylon gradually came to realize what had actually happened. In his drunken condition, he had, in fact, burgled his own house and then set his own house on fire. The next day, after he had sobered up, he was asked how he felt about robbing his own house. This is what Waylon Pendergrass said. I had no idea I had so many valuable possessions. Well, I sure hope you won't ever do anything quite as stupid as robbing yourself and setting your own house on fire. Nevertheless, there are times when all of us need to stop and reflect on our lives, on our possessions, and on what really matters in life. For even though we may never do something as foolish as what Wayland Pendergrass did, hopefully we will still possess the same truth he did. I had no idea I had so many valuable possessions. For you see, no matter who you are or what your financial status is, we all need to step back today and appreciate the richness of our lives. From material comforts like electricity and running water to things that make life easier like cars and mobile phones, our lives are rich. From our basic needs like food to luxuries other generations never dreamed of like computers and the internet, we are rich. From the freedoms we enjoy to the jobs we have, we We've been blessed with so many things that we take for granted. Even beyond the physical blessings, there's so much that God Almighty has given us through Jesus Christ. We have family and friends. We have the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have freedom of worship and freedom of speech and freedom to travel and so many freedoms that most people have never experienced. As Paul wrote in Ephesians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We are truly rich. The problem is, most of us don't consider ourselves rich. But if you could step back and view your life from an unbiased third party, you would discover that you actually have more than you think. If you could view your status from the position of someone else in the world, you would be surprised at what you see. Like Waylon Pendergrast, you may discover that you're richer than you think. 
So let's take some time today to step back and look at our lives from God's view. For when we do, we will discover surprising truths about what it means to be rich. But first, let's bow our heads and pray together. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you from the depths of our heart for every good and perfect gift you've given to us, every blessing you've given to each and every one of us, from the air we breathe and the water we drink and the food we consume, from the freedoms we have and the comforts of technology, we thank you that no matter our financial condition, we all have something we can praise you for today. And help us today to step back and view our lives as you see us. Help us to look at our lives from the advantage of heaven, that we are blessed in Christ with spiritual blessings. We are blessed with everything we need in you. We submit to you right now, we bind every voice of the devil that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to speak to our hearts, to change our minds and change our attitudes and change our way of life so that we can truly be grateful and give you the praise for how rich we are in Christ. We thank you that at the end of today, your name will be glorified and our lives will be changed. We ask it by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I want to invite you to take a moment, join your faith with mine right now. Put your hand on your chest and pray after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast. You picked a great day to join me as I launch a new sermon series entitled, How to Be Good at Being Rich. Over the next four weeks, we're going to discover exactly what the Bible says about being rich. And as we learn those truths, our lives will never be the same. Now, notice something with me today as we begin this series. This series is to teach you how to be good at being rich. I didn't say how to get rich. I didn't say how to get richer. This is not a financial seminar. I'm not here to teach you how to be rich. I'm here to teach you how to be good at being rich. You see, the most important thing is not about becoming rich. It's about being rich and being good at it. For the fact is, not everyone is good at being rich. Maybe it's because there's no school you can attend to study how to be rich. Maybe it's because you don't get to practice being rich in advance. You may be surprised to hear this, but the facts are clear. A lot of rich people are not good at being rich. And because of that, they end up either losing their fortunes or being miserable with their wealth. Take athletes, for example. We've all heard stories about athletes who make a ton of money while they play sport, but within a few years of retirement, the money disappears. For example, the average salary for a Premier League football player in the UK is 50,000 US dollars per week. Hey, that's $2,600,000 a year. But the charity Expro estimates that 60% of Premier League players are bankrupt within five years after retiring. The great footballer Paul Gascoigne is one example. The former England football star played for several highly prestigious clubs, including Glasgow Rangers and Tottenham Hotspur. When Gascoigne joined Lazio, he received a $3 million signing bonus. He signed a contract worth $34,000 a week. But struggles with alcohol, drug addiction, and depression have seen him in debt. In fact, at one time, he owed a tax debt of more than $250,000. And then there's Celestine Babayaro, a former Nigeria football star. He once earned $45,000 every week, every seven days. But Babayaro racked up crippling debt and was declared bankrupt in 2011. And it's not just athletes that are bad at being rich. Half, half of all lottery winners have spent the entire amount of their winnings within five years. So obviously, it's not enough to get rich. You have to learn how to be rich and be good at it. And believe it or not, the Bible has a lot to say to us about how to be good at being rich. So let's look at the Bible and find out today what the Word of God can teach us about 
how to be good at being rich. Now, to help us discover the truth, we prepared sermon notes. My sermon notes are available free of charge on my Facebook page, my YouTube channel, and on my website. Plus, the sermon notes come with a daily devotional, which will enable you to keep learning from God's Word all week long. So I invite you to take out your sermon notes now. Follow along with me and find out how you're richer than you think. There at the top of your notes is our scripture text for today. It's found in 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. It's on your notes. It's on the screen in front of you. But I believe the word of God has the most impact when it's in our hearts and on our lips. So I'm going to ask you to read this passage out loud along with me today. Are you ready? Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You know, this is a great text. It has a lot of truth, a lot of good things to say. But many of us today might be tempted to overlook it because we could easily be deceived into thinking, this scripture doesn't apply to me. After all, this verse is talking to the rich. I'm not rich, so these verses aren't for me. But that's exactly where you're wrong. See, I believe these verses are talking to every single one of us today because whether we know it or not, all of us are rich. You may not think you're rich, you may not feel rich, but you're richer than you think. Of course, in order for me to convince you that you're rich, you'd have to define what it means to be rich. And that's not an easy definition to give. After all, what does it mean to be rich? How much money does it take to be rich? It can be very difficult to pin down an answer. You ask different people and you'll get a different response. To a poor man in a village, it might only take a hundred US dollars to be considered rich. To a businessman in the capital city, the amount is in the millions. This situation reminds me of the billionaire who was asked how much money he needed to be rich. The billionaire thought and then he replied, just a little bit more than what I have right now. And see, that's the problem with defining wealth. Not only do different people have a different opinion about what makes someone rich, there's another thing that makes the figure difficult to determine. The problem is being rich is a moving target. Take my life, for example. My view of what it means to be rich has changed over the years. When I was a child, being rich meant I could eat whatever I wanted. When I was a child, we almost never went out to eat at a restaurant. We didn't buy takeaway because takeaway was for rich people. And if we ever did go out to a restaurant to eat, we only ordered the less expensive food. If something on the menu cost $10 and another item cost $5, we had to order the $5 food, whether we liked it or not. So as a child, I thought being rich meant that I could go to a restaurant and order whatever food I liked. But as I got older, my view changed. As a young man, being rich meant having a nice car. I didn't have a car, but I sure wanted a car. I couldn't afford to buy a car, so obviously being rich meant owning a car. If I saw a friend with a nice car, I would think, wow, that guy is rich. He has a car. Then, as a middle-aged man, my view changed. Being rich meant not only going to restaurants and owning a car, being rich also meant owning a nice house. If I visited a friend who lived in a nice house, I would think, wow, he's really making it. He's rich. And what about now? Well, now being rich means something different to me. And that's the problem with understanding wealth. The definition changes. If I, as a child, if I could have seen where I am in life now, the child would have said, that man 
is rich. If your great-grandparents could see all that you possess today, they would be amazed at how rich you are. We have things that our ancestors never dreamed of. Electricity, running water, television, internet, mobile phones, cars, medicine to cure disease. But if you ask most people, are you rich? They'll say, no. Rich is the other guy. Rich is something more than what I am. And because of that, many of us don't feel rich. And that's the real problem, because even if you are rich, if you don't feel rich, you won't act rich. If you don't think you're rich, you won't be good at being rich. So let's stop for a moment and consider these facts. The global median income is just 850 US dollars a year. That's about $70 per month. That means if you take home more than $70 in your currency equivalent per month, you are richer than half the people on the planet. Let's look at some other examples. If you are single and have a take-home pay of $164 US dollars or the equivalent in your currency per month, then you are in the richest 25% of the world's population. Three quarters of the world earns less than you. If you have a family of four with a combined monthly net income of $984, you are in the richest 15% of the world's population. 85% of the world earns less than you. And if you're in a family of five with a combined monthly net income of $1,640 or the equivalent in your currency, then you are in the richest 10% of the world's population. You earn more money than 90% of the six billion people on the planet. There's a website on your notes that you can visit and enter your information and see for yourself how rich you are. But the fact is more than two billion people around the globe live on less than US $2 per day. That's $60 per month per person for all living expenses, food, housing, clothing, medical needs, soap, everything. So you are richer than you think. Now, please don't misunderstand me today. There's nothing wrong with having money. God has blessed you and I. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty about what you have and how you're blessed. I'm trying to make you grateful for a heart overflowing with gratitude to God does good things for others. Great things flow from a grateful heart. And in fact, gratefulness is the first step we can all take today to be good at being rich. So to answer the question, how can I be good at being rich? Your first step is be thankful. Everybody say be thankful. Our scripture text begins with this statement of truth. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And friends, listen carefully to what our text is telling us. It tells us God has given you all the things freely to enjoy. And it's time we got this truth deep down in our hearts. Because if you believe the word of God, if you believe what this verse tells us, then you are richer than you think. You're blessed in heavenly places through Jesus. You have access to anything you genuinely need through Christ. You've been freely given everything so you can enjoy abundance abundant life in Christ. The problem is we've gotten our eyes so fixed on material things, we don't appreciate all the great things our God has given us. We all need air to breathe. You can't live without air. And there's never a day God charged you for that air. He's given you more air than you can breathe in a hundred lifetimes. We need life. And God gave it to us without any deposit, without any advance payment. We all need hope and dreams and imagination. And God has given us those things freely. We have family and friends. We have the word of God and the promise of God. We have the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus Christ. And even if no one else loves you, at least you have me. I love you, even if no one else does. And I'm praying for you today. We all need to get back to an attitude of gratitude. Gratitude has to become a way of life. That's why Ephesians 5 says, be very careful then how you live. So this is talking about the way you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And how do we do that? Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be careful how you live. Live wisely. Make the most of every moment of every day by always giving thanks to God. For here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. What doesn't turn to praise in your life turns to pride. If you don't live in a spirit of gratitude, you'll become bitter, proud, and envious. You'll be unable to enjoy the blessings you do have because you're focused on the blessings you don't have. You'll be miserable and ungrateful and troubled and anxious all because you're not thankful for all you have. That's why Colossians 3.15 ties peace in your heart with gratitude. Listen, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Many years ago, there was a very wealthy billionaire businessman. He was making so much money, he didn't know what to do with it all. But unfortunately, along with the money came pressure, worry, anxiety, high blood pressure, and ulcers. Finally, one day, his doctor told him, if you don't reduce your stress, you're going to die. So the billionaire decided to take a break and go off all alone to relax. He went to the beach and just sat on the beach watching the ocean. Then this rich man noticed an old fisherman nearby, just sitting in his boat with his grandson. The rich man thought, you know, I haven't been fishing in many years. I love to fish. Let me go and ask the man if he'll take me fishing. So he hired the fisherman and his grandson to take him out into the ocean to fish. They spent hours out at sea, just enjoying the day, the sunshine, the breeze, the water, and the businessman caught some fish. By the time they got back that night, the rich businessman felt so much better. He was amazed at how peaceful he felt. And then an idea struck him. There were many other rich men just like him who needed to take a break and relax. Well, he could start a business providing a weekend away from the stress and pressure of the world. They could charge the rich man lots of money and make a great profit. So the rich businessman started talking to the fisherman, selling him on the idea. Look, the rich man said, we can build this business. I tell you, we can make a lot of money. When men find out how you can help them relax, they'll come in their numbers to hire you. Then you can buy more boats and hire more men and make more money. The business will just keep growing and growing, and then you'll become rich. The fisherman looked at the rich man and then said, And what will I do when I become rich? Well, the rich businessman said, when you become rich, then you can sell the business and retire. You can sit on the beach in your boat and relax all day with your grandson. You can fish when you want to or just enjoy the day. Won't that be great? The rich man asked. Yes, that would be great, the fisherman said. In fact, that's why I'm so content in life now. I sit on the beach in my boat and relax all day with my grandson. I can fish when I like or just enjoy the day. I already have all you are offering me. I guess I'm already rich right now. And so it is for all of us. If you can open your eyes to see all your blessings, you'll realize that you're richer than you think. The problem is, We aren't thankful for what we have because rather than focusing on what we have, we focus on what others have. We compare ourselves to others and we become discontent. And that brings us to our second truth today. Beware, don't compare. Listen to how our text for today continues. Command those who are rich not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. The two warnings in this verse are both problems that come when you compare yourself to other people. Arrogance or pride says, I'm better than him. My money sets me above her. And putting your hope in wealth is also rooted in comparing yourself to others. When you put your hope in wealth, you begin to take your value from what you possess. You consider yourself more important, more valuable, because you have more than someone else. The fact is, it's not wrong to be rich, but wealth can cause problems for you if you aren't good at being rich. 
See, money is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. If you're rich and you become proud, you will invite the judgment of God on your life. If you're rich and you end up trusting in your wealth, you will turn your heart away from God. See, here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. Wealth can become a substitute for God. And if you fall into the comparison trap, you will fall away from God and begin to chase worldly things. If you focus on comparing yourself to others, you will set up idols in your heart that will bind your soul and lead you astray. So beware, when you become arrogant or when you put your hope in your wealth, it's a sure sign you're chasing values based on comparing yourself to others. That's why 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We dare not compare ourselves to others, for whoever does so is not wise. And here's the problem with comparing. There's always someone er than you. There's always someone richer, taller, smarter, better, beautifuler, handsomer than you. You have to overcome the tyranny of the er. Everybody say er. For you see, when you compare yourself to others, there will always be someone with a bigger er. But the truth is, appearances are deceiving, and their er life isn't always what you think it is. Think about that rich man you know. He's richer than you. But did you know he has a horrible marriage? He owns a big house in an exclusive community, and he owns a flat in London. He drives a fast car and has a couple million in the bank. But every night is hell as he and his wife battle over every little thing. His kids won't talk to him. His wife is trying to kill him, and he doesn't know who he can trust. Sure, he has a lot of friends. If you want to call people who are out for your money your friends... You may be a small boy compared to him, but if you have a happy home, you're richer than you think. Then there's that smart guy at school. He's smarter than you. But did you know he's never met his father? Maybe he's smart because he has a hole inside his heart that he's trying to fill. Maybe you see a result of an emptiness and a brokenness in him that he has no father who loves him. His father abandoned him, and so everything he does is to earn and to strive and to struggle to get approval. If you have a dad who loves you, you are richer than you think. What about that pretty young lady next door? She's prettier than you. But even though she's beautiful, she doesn't think so. She thinks she's ugly. She wishes she could change her nose and make her lips bigger. If she had the money, she would do surgery to increase her lips and her hips and her breasts. She may look good to you, but you don't know the pain inside. If you can be at peace with who you are and how God made you, you are richer than you think. For jealousy and envy are cruel tormentors that can rob you of your peace and steal your joy. All the money in the world does you no good if jealousy and envy eat away at your soul. That's why Galatians 5, 19 to 21 lists jealousy and envy as works of the sinful nature. Not only will they make you miserable, but they will keep you from the kingdom of God. Listen to God's word. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. We know those are bad, but listen, hatred, discord, jealousy. Jealousy is listed with immorality and idolatry. Fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Beware. Don't compare. Be thankful for what you have because you're richer than you think. A few years ago, a young boy named Kenny was walking 
along the road near his village. The sun shone brightly overhead and the sweat poured off his face. He mopped his brow as he trudged along the road. The longer he walked, the heavier his load became. He had started the morning calling out his services to anyone who would listen, but it seemed no one needed their shoes repaired today. Just then, Joseph passed Kenny on the bike. Joseph was riding a bright blue bicycle, pedaling fast as the breeze blew through his hair. If only I had a bicycle, Kenny thought to himself. That's my problem. If I had a bicycle, then all my problems would be solved. I wouldn't have to walk along under the hot sun, wiping the brow and the sweat. I would let the breeze blow through my hair to keep me cool. Joseph pedaled hard, letting the anger inside of him push the bicycle forward. This was his third trip to the village. It seemed his uncle couldn't remember anything, and so he kept sending the boy back home to collect something. First, it was his mobile phone, which his uncle had left on the table in his house. Then it was a tool he forgot. Now it was some document he needed. Didn't his uncle appreciate how hard it was to ride a bicycle back and forth all day? Ah! Joseph was sure his uncle had never ridden a bicycle in his life. He vowed that one day, when he was rich, he would never ride a bicycle again. Just then, Patrick sped by Joseph on a motorbike, blowing his horn. Joseph had to turn his bicycle suddenly and nearly fell off into the ditch. That's what I need, Joseph thought to himself. If only I had a motorbike. Then my problems would be over. I wouldn't have to ride this bicycle back and forth. I could make the journey in a fraction of the time. Patrick barely noticed as he sped past Joseph, racing to the city. His mind was focused on only one thing, getting to the hospital on time. His mother lay in a coma, and his sister had called and urged Patrick, hurry, hurry, and he had to see her one more time. He had to tell her, he had to tell her he was sorry for what he'd done. Patrick had not meant to say the things he did or to hurt his mother, but the pressure of his new business had been so great, and it seemed that his mother didn't notice how hard he was working. He, he, she didn't appreciate that he was paying his sister school fees and doing the best he could. It had finally become too much for him, and he lashed out at his mom in a fit of frustration. Just then, a big Mercedes-Benz saloon car overtook Patrick on his motorbike. Ah, Patrick thought, if only I had a car like that. One day I will get rich and I'll get a car. One day I will prove to my family how hard I work, how successful I am. One day! His thoughts trailed off as the Mercedes-Benz sped off into the distance. Mr. Adams sat in the back of his Mercedes-Benz as the driver took him home. He didn't notice Patrick or Joseph. He was deep in thought. Just a few weeks left, the doctor said. Maybe days. The cancer had spread, and there was nothing they could do. So Adams sat in the back of his Mercedes-Benz on his way to his village to say goodbye and pack up his things and prepare for the end. Just then, Mr. Adams' car passed Kenny walking along the road. Ah, Adams thought, if only I could be a boy again, a young boy, just like that one walking along the road. Look at him, not a care in the world with all the time on his hands. If I could only be like him, I would walk every day strolling up and down casually, no hurries, no worries, no cancer, no bills, no family to pull me and push me. If only I could be a boy again, walking along the road. So Kenny envied Joseph, and Joseph envied Patrick, and Patrick envied Mr. Adams, and Adams wished he could be just like Kenny, walking along the road with his whole life ahead of him. And none of them could even see the good in their own lives because they were too busy comparing themselves to someone else. Each one thought the other was rich. And when they compared themselves to one another, they became discontent with their own status. 
But being rich isn't about the property you own or the car you drive or the money in the bank. To be good at being rich, you have to be content. For it's not just what you have that makes you rich. It's the ability to enjoy what you have. That's why Ecclesiastes 5.19 says, Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. And that's our third step to being good at being rich. Be content. Everybody say, be content. Listen to these powerful words from our text. Command those who are rich to put their hope in God. In other words, don't trust in the riches of this world. Put your hope in God. For when your hope is in him, you can be content no matter what happens in the world around you. That's the secret the apostle Paul discovered. Listen to his words in Philippians 4, 11 and 12. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And see, the problem with a lack of contentment is that you're always struggling. You can never be satisfied with what you have. You can never enjoy life. You're so busy striving for something more, you don't enjoy the journey. And until you accept that you're richer than you think, you'll always be struggling and striving for more. You'll be consumed with crossing the line into riches rather than enjoying the riches you already have. A few years ago, two oil tankers docked at the port of Apapa in Nigeria to pick up fuel to carry to the U.S. One vessel was old and one was new. And when the sailors on the new vessel learned that both ships were headed to the same port in the U.S., they started mocking the sailors on the old vessel. We may both be headed to the U.S., they said, but we will surely reach there ahead of you. <laughs> the sailors on the new vessel taunted those on the old. While you'll still at sea, we'll be enjoying good life. When the news of this ridicule reached the captain of the old vessel, a dark look came over his face. He was a very competitive person, and he hated to be challenged and lose. So he determined to do everything in his power to make sure his ship reached the U.S. first. Well, the two tankers set off from Nigeria to cross the ocean. When the newer vessel started to pull ahead of the older one, the captain of the older vessel pushed his ship and its engines at full capacity. He ran the engines at full steam, consuming huge quantities of fuel just to keep pace with the new ship. Eventually, His first mate came to tell the captain of the old vessel, if you keep up this pace, we will exhaust all the fuel allotted for the journey. The captain thought for a moment, then barked out this order. Use the fuel that we're carrying as cargo. Don't hold back. I want the engines running at full speed. I don't care how much fuel we consume. We must win this race. And so they began drawing from the supply of fuel that they were carrying as cargo. Day and night, they ran the engines at full speed, burning thousands of gallons of fuel. They kept pace with the new vessel. And just as they both approached the U.S. port, the older vessel pulled into the lead. The older vessel entered the U.S. first. The captain of the old ship smiled and his sailors cheered at their victory. But their joy was short-lived. For you see, when they went to discharge their load of fuel, there was nothing left in the cargo of the old ship. The older ship had won the race, but burned its entire cargo in the process. And sadly, this is how many families are living today. You're caught up in the rat race of life. You're always on the go. You're always working late and leaving early. You're gone to a sales meeting and gone for a seminar and gone for a project and gone for this and gone for that. You're in Shanghai and Dubai. You're gone, gone, gone. You've got to get ahead. You've got to win. You've got to get rich. But in the process, you're burning 
the cargo God gave you. God gave you a family to carry through this life. God gave you a precious cargo that cannot be replaced. God gave you a wife, a husband, children. Don't burn the cargo up just so you can win the race. Learn how to be thankful for what you have. Don't compare. Instead, learn to overcome the tyranny of the err. Learn to be content with what you have. That's the truth we find in Hebrews 13.5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Being rich is not about what you have. It's about what you do with what you have. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 9, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. This series is to teach you how to be good at being rich. It's not about how to get rich. It's not about how to get richer. I'm here to teach you from the Word of God how to be good at being rich. How can you be good at being rich? You can be good at being rich when you're thankful. Acknowledge that you're richer than you think. Be thankful for every good gift God has given. Let your blessings turn to praise, not to pride. Be good at being rich by being thankful. You can be good at being rich when you refuse to compare. If you succumb to the tyranny of the err, you'll never be happy. You can have all the money in the world, but you'll never enjoy it if all you do is compare yourself to others. And you can be good at being rich when you're content. Live life with contentment, and you'll never lack peace and joy. In good times and in bad, you'll be able to live life to its fullest when you rest in God's love and his presence with you. Because you're richer than you think. So why not bow your head with me right now and thank God. Father, we thank you. Thank you for every good gift you've given to us. Thank you that in Christ, we have every spiritual blessing. Lord, today we confess we have been discontent because we focused on worldly wealth. We've grumbled and complained. We've, we've said we don't have what we need. We haven't valued what you've given to us. Right now, Lord, I ask you to forgive your people for complaining. Help us today and every day to turn our thoughts to you in praise, to give you thanks for all you've given to us. Break the tyranny of the earth from our life. Help us never to compare ourselves to others, but to simply be content in you, who you made us to be, where you've placed us in life, let us trust in you and walk with you so that we can be good at being rich. We thank you now by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Truth For Today with Pastor Whitcomb. I trust that a message and our ministry is a blessing to you. Next week on Truth For Today, Pastor Whitcomb continues the sermon series, How to Be Good at Being Rich, with a sermon entitled, The Trouble with Money. Here is how you can get more from Pastor Whitcomb. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home. Take this message deeper by watching the sermon again on YouTube. There are many life-changing sermon videos by Pastor Whitcomb you can watch or download for free. Simply visit youtube.com to find Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb's YouTube channel and subscribe. Don't trade what you want most for what you want in the moment. You can also find the sermon notes and daily devotional for this and other sermons by visiting Pastor Whitcomb's website at pastorrichardcwhitcomb.com. Vision is vital vital to your victory. Receive daily inspiration by following Pastor Whitcomb on Twitter at RevRCW. Like and follow Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb on Facebook for more inspiration.
Let us know how this broadcast has changed your life. Send us an email to testify at agapehousegana.org. Send your prayer request to prayer at agapehousegana.org. Find out more about the ministry of Agape House New Testament Church by visiting agapehousegana.org or Agape House New Testament Church on Facebook. God bless you. On behalf of Pastor Whitcomb and all of us here at Agape Gospel Mission, we say thanks for tuning in today. We look forward to being with you again next week. Until then, stay blessed and keep walking with Jesus.